Hello and welcome to JTV YouTube Live Shark. I'm your host, Jeanette Burke. Today I'm joined by Sharon Nice Arbus. She is a blogger and book author. She's here to talk about her new book, The Most Amazing Department Store, based on her experiences growing up in Montreal. And the story is kind of based on Simpsons department store that was existing back then. Welcome to JTV YouTube Live short, Sharon Nice Arbus. How are you today? Thank you. Hi, I'm very well. Thank you for having me on your show today. You're welcome. So... Sharon, you grew up in Montreal, and this book that you wrote, The Most Amazing Department Store, it's based on Simpsons, but I guess it's also based on a few other department stores like it. Why did you choose that role model uh, as, as an exemplary sort of model for to base the book on? And what can you tell us about your experiences growing up, going to Simpsons, maybe even some of the other women in your family? Surely. So um, the reason why or how I came up with this story is because of my grandmother. My grandmother, Lily, actually, I'm Jewish, so she was my bubby. It's a Jewish way of saying grandmother. She worked at Simpsons Department Store for many years. And I always knew that about her, but I kind of, as I grew up, I put it out of my mind until one day my daughter comes home from visiting a friend in Montreal. And she said, you know, I just found out that my friend's great-grandmother and my great-grandmother, which is my bubby, worked together at Simpsons Department Store, and they were really good friends. That coincidence completely floored me. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was bumping into furniture like, what am I? this is crazy. I was thinking, what were their conversations like? How were they treated? How did they spend their days? Did they get promoted? How were they treated as Jewish women in the 1950s? So I sat down and I began to write. Okay. So we are going a little out of order, but since you brought it up, I'm going to carry forth on it. Jewish women in the 1950s in Montreal at Simpsons Department Store, how were they treated? And not just the women working there, but the Jewish women shopping there. Now, mm -hmm. I find this very interesting because I, too, am Jewish, and I grew up in a retail family. I do not come from Montreal, but halfway, um, and halfway between Toronto and Montreal. Um, I spent a lot of time in Montreal growing up. You lived there. And I'm very interested to know the answer to this question, particularly because I'm going to add this in before you answer. Montreal was the place most Jewish people came to when they came to Canada initially. And the reason for that was because uh, Quebec was supposed to be more tolerant to Jews than other parts of Canada because of, um, I think it was Joseph Papillon, who was a big figure in the political scene in Quebec, who was also Jewish. Um, so I'm curious to hear your answer about how these Jewish women who worked there, the two protagonists that you portray in the book, and one Lily, obviously named after your grandmother and uh, or your booby and um, and the shop, the, the people who shopped there. How were they treated in the 1950s? I have one sentence to answer that question. And this sentence actually lit the fire under my, I'll say, to uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. really get going. And this yeah. is what happened when my grandmother, Lily, applied for the job at Simpson. Do you know what they told her? They said, well, we don't normally hire Jews. Oh, but she did get the job though. She did. They were like reluctant. Okay, we don't normally hire Jews, but you can work here. She needed the job. And so she took it. So that sentence is all I needed to work on to create the world of Sunderland's, which is the fictional name of the department store in the book. And that's all I needed to create conversations, to create the bond between Vivian and Lily, uh, to create a conflict. And I went with that. 
And okay. so I created. So how in my far to come? I mean, Canada is still a pretty racist country, unfortunately. How far has it come? And how has the retail world changed since the 1950s? Obviously, online shopping has taken over. We've seen a lot of closures in the retail world. Nordstrom's being one. Many others predicted in the near future, five years, they think another 800 stores will be closing due to online shopping um, and Amazon. So what's changed? How has the experience changed? So much has changed and it's really sad. And I say that you can see my face fall. And uh, that's part of the reason why I wrote the book is because I wanted to bring back nostalgia. I wanted to bring back that feeling of excitement when you entered a department store and mm -hmm. all was beautiful and everyone was helping you. And there was like an excitement and and like the hunt of finding something. And granted, walking into, I'm going to say the bay, because um, that's still around, um, mm -hmm. it's still exciting. But it's, I talked to so many people about this, and uh, especially at my book launch. And they, they came up to me and said, I remember when I went with my grandmother to Simpsons or the Bay or Eaton's. And we had lunch together in and, and this beautiful coffee shop. And they re reminisced what it was like back then. And it's not the same anymore. So it really changed. Now, there are still department stores. We still, you, you know, you can go to Yorkdale. It's still there. But the ease of Amazon has taken at least half of the joy away. So I wanted to write a period piece on what it was like and how exciting it was. And so I hope Let's I answered a little deeper into that. Um, so back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, I would say even till the 80s, you know, I also have these memories of the department store, which to me does these department stores, yes, they're still around, but I don't think they exist in the same form. I think they are struggling to compete with online uh, shopping. And I don't think that online shopping gives you the same experience because as you're saying, like it was a day out, it was a memorable day out. It was a bonding between women, family members, aunts, daughters, mothers, grandmothers. And it was an experience. I also recall going to Yorkdale and having lunch at, um, the, the restaurant I think was called Ar Arcadia Room or something like that. The, the restaurant that used to be very nice. It was on the second floor. And it was like, you you know, it was a whole experience. Like you say, it was like almost a whole day outing where, you know, you would get dressed up. You'd go to the department store. You'd walk in. You'd see beautiful displays. You'd smell gorgeous fragrances. You might have even gone because there was a celebrity going to be there or some other big event happening, a fashion show. There was the room at Simpsons where you'd have showings. They don't have these things anymore. And they used to serve tea and a, a bunch of things, right? How, how do you feel that taking these things away not only impacted the experience and the joy of shopping, but, you know, how will it change the retail sector, the retail business, the retail in Canada and the U.S. going forward? Are we ever going to have these kind of experiences again? You know, I... Uh, it's funny, you're not the first person to ask me that question. And unfortunately, I can't answer that because I don't work in retail management. So I don't know what it's going to do to our industry, although I would like to talk about um, you know, what it was like to write the book and yeah. um, the characters and um, the challenges that they went through and the obstacles they faced. Okay, so go ahead. I'm trying to kind of bring that out through these questions, but we can just go and take take, take the lead. Okay, so what I want people to get, first of all, I'll tell you what the book is about. So the book is about two women who worked in a department store in Montreal during the 1940s and 50s, and they faced anti-Semitism and sexism and rejection. So why did I write this book? I wanted to write a story that I wanted to read. I love historical fiction. It really takes you back somewhere and you feel like you're there. And especially if it's entertaining because you get to learn something and then you get to read about fun things like how they put, made a Gibson roll. It's funny because um, I wrote this during the pandemic and when everyone was making sourdough bread, 
I was researching a Gibson roll, which has nothing to do with bread. And it's basically how to wrap your hair into a bun and tuck it in. And it's called the Gibson roll. And so I put that into the book. I had a really fun time researching how you take off makeup, how people would draw on lipstick and what kind of movie stars they would try to emulate. So it was it was a really fun adventure, you know, historically. I mean, just to get back there and to see what it was like in um, department stores, cosmetic counters, things like that. And what can we learn from this, this nostalgia? How can we uh, apply any of this in today's world? Certainly it must have some relevance. Sure. Well, I want what I want people to get out of this book is I want them to enjoy a light read, but learn valuable lessons. I want Jewish people to read the book and have like um, a shared bond, um, find strength in each other to, to talk about it and lean on each other for support. And then people outside our Jewish community, our allies, will hope, hopefully deepen their understanding of the Jewish experience and gain some interest and ask us questions. I would love that. And to take a step back and question, what are they chanting? What are they saying before making a choice? Okay. And what about the sort of, there's a woman's angle also to this book. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the time, going to these stores was a sense of freedom and independence for women when they really didn't have a lot of other avenues or options that were limited. So what's the message you have about women and women's rights and how how uh, the experience of this writing this book, but also in shopping can be liberating for women? Well, these two women, Lily and Vivian, were actually, they're very different personalities. Uh, one was more uh, going, one was more shy, one was more uh, able to stand up for herself and um, was more career driven, um, but also to face obstacles and to face them head on and to take risks. Like, for example, Lily... Yeah. I don't want to give it away to anyone who hasn't read the book yet, but she does something that's quite rare and very brave in the book. And she ends up okay in the end. And uh, unfortunately, this whatever she this risk she took was very scary, but it's something that she had to do. And that's an example of being brave. Mm -hmm. And since the book does deal a lot with anti-Semitism in the workplace, what advice do you have? And this is a very important question because unfortunately today, both in Canada and the United States, we're dealing with this whole um, theory of this, you know, white entitlement where Jewish people are, uh, it's like other races are frowning upon Jewish people being educated or moving themselves forward in any profession. In fact, there's kind of a movement to say we should go backwards. So what's your advice for asserting yourself in the workplace as a Jew? Because, you know, as you mentioned, Lily and uh, Vivian, Vivian both excelled at the job, but in different ways. So what's your advice? That's a really tough question. Um, to have a conversation, if that's possible. Um, I was told like, on social media not to engage but to reach out to our protectors, police, um, uh, people in parliament, um, signing petitions, getting involved, attending peaceful marches, those things to do, if that makes sense. But in the workplace, how, do, how would you suggest being able to move forward if you're being held back just because you're Jewish? Or you mentioned maybe not even being able to get the job because you're Jewish. Well, I don't have experience in that because I, I haven't been in a work environment in, in many years. I, I work from home. I, I'm not the right person to ask that question. Um, all I can say is that something very similar happened to me when I used to be a copywriter in advertising. And I actually brought this story into the book. It was in 1996. And uh, Rosh Hashanah was coming up. And I wanted to take the time off to go to synagogue. So I asked my boss if I can have those days off. And he said, why don't you take your 
holiday on a different date. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, does that mean you can take Christmas on December 23rd? Exactly. He didn't like that. Yeah, he didn't like that very much. And I guess I was a bit, you know, maybe ballsy. But uh, I went to Human Resources and told them what happened. And that was that. And I got my days off. He got in trouble. So I actually brought that into the story. Mm -hmm. um, Lily asked, it was 1951. That's the date I made it in the book. And um, Lily asked for time off for Rosh Hashanah and she almost gets fired. Uh -huh. So I brought in personal stories into the book. Okay, well, that's great. And also there's laws against that because of people who went in 1951 and did what Lily did. That's yeah. how change gets made, right? Gets yes, done. it does. It does. Okay, I guess so we're nearing the end of the interview. And there's just like a couple more things I want to touch on. Sure. One is like, I want to give you a chance to say sort of anything else about the book that, that you really want to say and have known about the book. So go ahead, this is your moment. Okay. Um, why did I choose a department store to write a book, a yeah. setting of the book? Well, um, I have a connection because I used to work in uh, the cosmetic department in a drugstore and I have personal experience of dealing with customers and also initiation jobs um, I brought into the book. So for example, when I, my first day on the job in the drugstore, my boss told me to clean a nail polish rack from top to bottom, it took me the whole week. And it was like an initiation for me. So I want to bring that in. It was like, a, it was a challenge. And of course, back in 1987, I did not text my parents and say, oh my God, I can't believe they're making me do this. Because there was no Blackberry or smartphone back then. Um, but I, I, I did it and it made me stronger and it actually grounded me. And I wanted that to happen to the, the characters as well. So I, just, I brought that in. But I've always loved being around department stores. Um, I find them glamorous, exciting, and almost like my, when people walk into the forest and they like being around trees, I like being around cash registers and, uh, pretty things wrapped in cellophane and perfume and bright lights. To me, it's my Mecca. It's, it's where I feel comfortable. It's where I just, all things are pretty and beautiful and it really relaxes me. So I, why not write about, have that as a, choose that as a setting and why not write keep that as a setting and write about that and surround my characters around that. Yeah, no, I definitely think that a lot of women can relate to that. They, they have the same feeling. Uh, and I think, you know, that's why the majority of customers probably in a department store were women buying things for women, but also buying things for men, right? How many women would choose their husband's clothing? Same thing, right? Yeah. Um, um, so the one comment on about your book, before telling us where to go, giving us your website to go. I'm, I'm, oh yeah. So what's my background? How's that? Could I talk about that? Sure. Okay. Um, I used to be a copywriter and um, after having kids, I always wanted to write a book. So I have two prior publications that um, are young adults. Um, and actually at this book, uh, The Most Amazing Department Store is quite a departure from my other two books, but um, the other two books, um, there is an interesting connection because they they deal with creating strong, independent middle school kids. And I look at the characters, Vivian and Lily, and I see them as very strong, independent women. And I, I hope they're a good example for all ages who read the book. Mm -hmm, I'm sure they are. OK, we're going to go to you're going to tell me your website where to go to buy the book. Okay. Hold up the book cover when you tell me where to go buy the book. Absolutely. So the most amazing department store is available on Amazon and Indigo and also many independent bookstores. If you can't find it, ask the, the salesperson at the uh, cash register at the, oh my God, that's so old fashioned. Um, ask the owner of the bookstore to order it and they will. Okay. And your website, please. SharonNeeseArbus.com. Okay. And we'll share all that in the show notes. So thank you so much for joining me today. I want to thank my audience for coming by and listening and 
hearing this great information. You can catch us every Wednesday, JTV YouTube Live Shorts. We feature book authors, small business owners, and professionals in this unique series. Again, this is Jeanette Burke, your host, signing off, thanking you for being with us to get today, and we will see you next time. Bye.